we start with uh, shoulder board and I would like to thank uh, four experts. Probably we know them because they did a lot of publications regarding this topic, uh, how to manage a posterior shoulder instability. Philippe Moroder, you know, this is uh, now the head of the shoulder and elbow department in the Carity Hospital in Berlin. Uh, he works a lot with, uh, with uh, uh, Marcus and he develops a pacemaker for posterior instability and he will talk about that today, probably. Uh, Porcellini, Giuseppe from Modena, is also a head of the sh uh, Department of Shoulder and Elbow on Orthopedics. And uh, he did a lot of publication, and this is an expert for sport injury, but shoulder arthroplasty also. Buddy, yeah. Buddy Savoy, you know very well, because uh, a long time ago, I uh, maybe 30, 30 years ago, when I saw him in the American Academy with... Uh, arthroscopy of the shoulder, and this is perfect expert regarding posterior instability anterior on arthroscopy. Or regarding Matthew, Matthew Provence, uh, who is working in Vail, in Colorado, he does a shoulder on knee arthroplasty, on knee arthroscopy, a lot of sport injuries, and maybe he will go in a few minutes. So with uh, Jean-David, you know very well, we, we try to, to propose uh, three cases for, for our expert and they will uh, offer their expertise regarding this case. I, I start with the first, first case and this is a woman, uh, 50 years old, she does a lot of sports and particularly on ball. Uh, she is a right dominant, uh, and uh, in uh, January 2020, during a match, uh, mm -hmm. she had the posterior shoulder dislocations, and uh, so they reduced the posterior shoulder dislocation uh, immediately without any X-rays, any hospital, and after this trauma, she had six recurrent posterior dislocation, but with no traumatic uh, etiology during sleeping or writing. And uh, I saw this patient with a, a very extreme painful shoulder, and the dislocation was reduced in uh, external rotation. When I did a clinical examination, she was hyperlax. When she tried to arise her upper limb, in pronation, there is immediately a posterior head dislocation, but in supination, it was <clears throat> predictable. More important is the scapula dyskinesia and uh, a painful pectoris minor insertion. And she describes some finger paresthesis. I did a video, and I would like to show you the video because this is the most important. You see that this, the left side is normal. You see that the left side is normal. She has a hyperlax, but no pain, no posterior instability, no anterior instability. On the right side, you see that immediately posterior dislocation. The second point is that there is a scapula winging. When I stabilize the scapula, it's possible to maintain in elevation. In supination, there is no posterior dislocation. When I stabilize the scapula, she's able to rise the top of but she's not very easy. She doesn't control the scapula, even I maintain with my hand posteriorly. This is the X-rays. There is no bony lesion, but you see that there is a posterior dislocation. Okay. 
Okay. Maybe maybe we we can discuss about uh, maybe the clinical examinations that you do in this kind of patient on some comments on the X-rays before to to show you the CT scan on uh, the other one. Uh, buddy, uh, please ca can you can you give uh, some comments regarding uh, how do you exam this kind of patient with a posterior dislocation, very, very easy, on dyskinesia of the scapula. What do you look for? So I think <clears throat> one of the critical things is, as you showed, you start with the non-affected shoulder and see, see how that shoulder tracks, see where the problem is. Because with a female, you have a combination of some generalized laxity, maybe not a true EDS, but there will be laxity and widening of the rotator interval. And I think the scapular assist test is very critical. And you showed that eloquently <clears throat> for us. I like to, to check and palpate the rotator interval because I think it's going to be wider in this patient. And then the pectoralis minor is usually tender and tight because of the dyskinesia. I like to do a serratus test. I will back up a little bit where you have them push against your hand backwards and see if the scapula can reduce on its own. I know Bassem likes the one in about 30 degrees of flexion, which is a functional winging, but I just want to make sure the serratus works at all. Upper trap is usually tight. Um, mid and lower trap are not working. So I check all of that first. And then I like to do a, a posterior load and shift and a chem test and just see if there's popping. And so the question in my mind is always with a traumatic initial dislocation <clears throat> was she always hyperlax with loose rotator interval and this is just an exacerbation or was she controlled like she was in this case on the other shoulder and now has a labral tear <clears throat> which means she can no longer compensate in any way and has no feedback so her shoulder is winging more and uh, the Whipple test hand in front of the opposite shoulder and pushing down with and without a scapular assist, I think is critical on this because if in, in my patients, if I can stabilize the scapula and they can hold up and the shoulder doesn't go backwards to me, that becomes a rehabilitation process and not a surgical process. If they're positive with the Whipple test and also positive and dislocate or subluxate even with scapular retraction, those tend, at least for me, become more of a surgical patient. So I think my, my physical exam is very critical as to how I approach the patient. Okay. I have a very silly question. How do you hold the scapula of the patient and perform the Whipple test? You're, you have one <clears> hand <throat> behind and... Yes, no, it's a very good question because you sit there and you hold this way. And then, so I'm standing on the side because especially with posterior, I will put my thumb on the back of the, of the glenohumeral joint so that it doesn't dislocate all the way out. I'll be able to catch it and push it back in. So I start to push, and if they start to subluxate, I can use my thumb to hold it. When I go to reduce the scapula, I use two hands, reduce the scapula first, put my hand on the inferior medial board of the scapula and hold it, and then bring the arm up. And when they can't control it, that they can't the scapula, I can't generate enough force to hold it. Philippe did a great job using two hands to hold the manuals uh, manually hold the scapula. But if I can't do it with just a simple uh, scapular assist, then they can't control it, and it's very difficult to rehabilitate them. That was an excellent question. Philip, uh, Philip, uh, what what do you think about? Uh, because if I summarize, before the trauma, no problem. She did uh, on ball, any problem. After the trauma, there is a, a recurrent dislocation, daily activity with painful and. Uh, it's not a voluntary dislocation. It's a, it's a secondary to the trauma. What do you think, Philip? The problem with the patient history is always, was it a true trauma or was it just an event that can be classified as a trauma if the patient tells you it was one? Uh, but you don't know how much force actually was working uh, in the shoulder in this particular moment. So it's very difficult to distinguish whether this was an adequate trauma or just a trauma as it was reported. So in order to distinguish whether a trauma caused a structural defect, I always look at the MRI scans or CT scans in this particular case um, to distinguish whether a structural defect might actually be the cause of this posterior shoulder instability. 
In this particular case, with the age of the patient and the hyperlexity, I just have a little, uh, my idea is that it has a large functional component to it, as Buddy already explained very nicely. So what I like to do is I always ask the patient, can you show me your shoulder dislocation? And then many patients actually are able to just raise their arm, it will pop out the back and then they return down. If the shoulder dislocates already in the mid-range of motion without you pushing backwards, without doing any exertion at all, and you don't find any MRI structural lesions that are able to cause this posterior shoulder instability, it's likely a functional cause. And then I agree with Buddy that a rehabilitative uh, process would be the choice uh, of treatment, at least in my hands, and surgery would only be a second line of treatment. Uh, Giuseppe, do, do you do a comment regarding yes, the Yes, yes, it's very, uh, clinical case is very interesting. First of all, uh, the clinical history. Of course, he's not uh, a football liner, not overuse. He's a typical female with, uh, I think, uh, not a, a real trauma, is an event probably MRI negative. I, 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 I love shoulder and so I want to know if there is a risk factor. Retroversion glenoid, capsular labral retroversion. I don't know, I don't know if in this case uh, there is a real dyskinesia. I think is uh, probably is uh, capsular labral elongation with the, uh, with the event, and the probably uh, no voluntary, no problem about uh, uh, the uh, voluntary dislo dislocation, but mechanical pop out. And uh, with this muscle, try to come in. The only uh, discussion is for me, this patient has no pain. So it's difficult to to, uh, to uh, in Italy, give an indication of surgery with no pain. Of course, mechanical problem. The second is sport active uh, gestuality, uh, mechanical uh, movement. So I try, I try physiotherapy, then I convince uh, if uh, the mechanical uh, uh, problem uh, is a, will uh, disappear, I, I give indication of surgery. I, I show you the MRI. This is a, okay, this is the MRI. CT. Yep. This is the MRI, you see that? There is no bony lesion, there is no. maybe... Uh... No, but uh, Philip, if you remember the Gerber uh, paper, uh, the posterior part of glenoid, it seems uh, rounded, or not? <coughs> I show you the, because we measure the posterior, posterior retrover retroversion of these patients, and you see that if you measure the retroversion, you have a 30 degree of retroversion. Yes. Uh... So the other thing, even with the retroversion though, you have a posterior cartilage analog. So when you look at the bone, the bone drops off because she's young. And then you have a very big, uh, essentially, you have a small tear in the labrum, but you have a big cartilage analog that ossifies late. And so if you measure the cartilage analog, then you don't have much retroversion because that is not bony ossified yet. And that's an adaptive response. A posterior one, if they avulse that analog, uh, it's kind of right where your bottom purple dot is. Um, if you avulse that, that becomes an absolute surgical necessity because that has to grow and form bone later on in life to have a, a normal glenoid. So if you measure from the tip where you see the dye posteriorly to the tip in the front, then your version all of a sudden changes to basically zero. So you have to play that yes. cartilage analog when you're going to treat this. Until what age do you take this into account? 
about 25. This this happens, and if you see it, it's most common. The injury to that, this doesn't look like that. You would see the dye going between that cartilage analog and the bone, but that may not ossify till about 25. So when you see these patients, you always want to use dye. You know, in the United States, everyone gets an MRI scan first, and that's it's not a good thing for this. Sometimes it's hard to see. So you want to have dye there so you can see that analog and see what role it's playing in posterior instability. But do you think that the posterior subluxation is not important for you? I, I think the posterior subluxation is, but I would not view this as a glenoid osteotomy candidate as much as I I'm still think there's a small labral tear and maybe a, a rehabilitation. And I would really like to see the rotator interval a little bit better because you have a lot of dye going medially between the coracoid and the glenoid. But to me, before you talk version, you have to talk about this analog because if you throw the analog into the mix, then all of a sudden you're more centered than you think, less posterior subluxation um, because that analog, uh, if you just colored it in and pretended it to be bone, then you would treat this a different way. So I think it's very important to know about that analog. But she's very she's painful. Very painful. Well, how, how do you explain the pain? The pain? So I think she's I think she's subluxating out the back. I think she's a posterior instability with scapular dyskinesia and winging, and uh, and a lax rotator interval. And so this would be one that if you could, if theoretically you could get her to stabilize the scapula, rehabilitation will be good. But I think the pain is from the pull of the interval stretching, and the shoulder coming out the back. Okay, Philippe, Philippe uh, uh, what, what is Philippe, your opinion? Are you an uh, expert uh, about uh, B0 and B2? Do you think this, this is a risk for, uh, uh, for the future about uh, posterior chondropathy or not? Philippe, do you have uh, an answer regarding the risk of chondropathy after posterior subluxation? Um, yeah, I actually do. Uh, just a quick comment on uh, on Buddy's comments. Uh, I completely agree. You always have to look for the cartilage as well, because this can compensate for the yeah. presumable increased retroversion uh, if you just look at the bone. And we found this in 24% of the cases in our study in young in a young population. So this is quite frequent. This is not something rare. Uh, and regarding the risk factor for posterior descending osteoarthritis, we just finished a multicentric study in Germany with the AGA, where we examined first-time dislocators. So I'm only able to give you some data on the first-time dislocators. What we found is an association between patients that have an increased posterior decentering after first-time posterior dislocation. They tend to have an increased static posterior decentering down the road, and we have a minimum follow up of five years, which is um, not very long but quite a uh, sufficiently long time, I believe. So, if you find a posterior decentering, this might be a risk factor for unfortunate posterior eccentric wear um, in the future. At least that's what the preliminary data shows. But, but if you summarize, this is uh, 15 years old. She does sports in competition. Uh, she has a recurrent posterior dislocation with a dyskinesia of the scapula. And you see that on the CT scan, there is no, no main lesion. It's a very little yeah. lesion, maybe labrum. What do yeah. you propose of treatment? In, so in my chart, the diagnosis would read non-controlled posterior positional functional shoulder instability. This would be my diagnosis. It's quite long. I'm sorry about that but she cannot control it. It's posterior for sure. It's position dependent. When she raises her arm, she pops out the mm -hmm. back. It's not those voluntary cases. They don't even move their arm. They just pull their shoulder out without any motion. And in my mind, the functional component is prevalent, even though for sure, Giuseppe is completely right. She has risk factors, but those are constitutional. It's hyperlaxity. Uh, it might be the rotator interval that, that, that is wide as well. Um, I don't think that the structural damage caused by this handball minor trauma, presumably minor trauma, is the true cause of the instability. So I would go for rehabilitation. Is, is indication of pacemaker? Uh, so uh, I'm maximally biased if you ask me this question, of <laughs> course, but in my hand, this would for sure be a good case to try the pacemaker for at least three months. 
Okay. Buddy, you agree with uh, Philip? So I think, <clears throat> Mike, I agree with the, his data. I, I've noticed that, uh, and we see the same thing in the elbow for certain conditions, that you can have a minor trauma, and then if you have a static fixed subluxation or decentering, then you need to correct it. And I think that if it corrects with rehabilitation and scapular repositioning, that you're better off than with a surgery. If it doesn't, then I would have the discussion that surgery is the beginning of your rehabilitation. And for me, a static posterior inferior subluxation has to be pulled back into place by shortening the cortical humeral ligament. It can't be pushed back into place by tightening the back of the shoulder. And I think one of the things that uh, McLaughlin and then Near did with, uh, with subscap moving it into the anterior hill sax defect when it occurred is they functionally shortened the coracohumeral ligament and pulled the humeral head back up front. And you would eliminate that fixed posterior subluxation. So, Philippe, I think your, your point of static subluxation is a bad indicator. And Philippe Moroder's data from AGA is very, very relevant to our discussion. <clears throat> because if she stays posterior, that's a problem. And so we have to correct that. I, I would agree with three months of really good rehabilitation that centers on scapular retraction. If you have the pacemaker, I think it is a good indication. This is what we've noticed in our patients. And, and uh, the correction of the posterior subluxation, at least in the short term, we've been using the pacemaker here, has been truly remarkable. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I was amazed when I saw Philippe Moroto use it, but I'm even more amazed now looking at my patients at how, how well it works. So I would hit with everything I can, but I also know that if I get a, 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 a Bernagel view and my humeral head is still sitting posteriorly subluxated, I'm going to operate on that patient because I think long-term the results are going to be poor. And what, Philippe, what does it change for you, positional or non-positional? Because uh, positional, you decide to rehab. If it's non-positional, do you decide to rehab even more, or what do you do? It's a completely different type of rehab. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays rehab is, uh, you know, it's it's a word that we use. We put down in our recommendation for the patient, and then they end up getting any kind of treatment. So if it's a posterior positional instability, for me, it's a clear indication to strengthen the retraction of the scapula, to strengthen the external rotators. You will have some patients where you can do a very nice wall slide test, which is the test when you elevate, you flex the arm, and you have the patient push, ag push against your resistance. If they are stable by just doing this, you know you will have a good time with uh, strengthening the external rotators in terms of outcome. If you have patients that dislocate out the back without any motion at all, it's a completely different beast that you have to handle. And you have to start more with core exercises and train because you won't be able to do a lot of exercises with those patients. It's a completely different approach in terms of rehabilitation. Yeah, some, sometimes Philippe, I have to another, do that. Another key point for me is uh, uh, activation, the muscle activation, because sometimes uh, this uh, female doesn't active uh, the muscle in right manner internal or external, uh, like uh, latissimus dorsi, for example. And second, uh, the postura, because uh, a lot of movement in internal rotation. Probably if you correct this movement, is another key, key point for uh, success uh, treatment. Okay, I, I started uh, the treatment, physiotherapy, uh, electrostimulation. This is not the pacemaker, but the, the physiotherapists use uh, electrostimulation of the, of the lower trapezius and levatoscapulae. And I, I did coltramil with uh, the drug for relaxation of the trapezius. And she, she's better. She's better, but she's still painful. And she has recurrent dislocation. Now she stabilizes the scapula very well, but she continues to dislocate posteriorly and with pain. And now we, this is in the situation today, and uh, I would like to know what, what do you do more? Uh, you wait, you continue physiotherapy, or you do capsuloplasty, or what do you do, uh, buddy? She had physiotherapy so, for how long right now? Six, uh, three months. 
goodness. So to me, yeah, if so. he's, yeah, if she's still painful and she's done a good job with the rehabilitation and we do a lot of supine exercises, I really communicate with the physical therapist very nicely. I agree with Philippe Moroder that you can't say rehab. It's very different for these patients. But if, if we've done taping, bracing, therapy and there's still no response and she's still painful and functionally impaired, I operate. And in this case, I would do a posterior label repair. I want to make sure that analog is solid um, and I'll work around it so I can get to the bone. If I need to tighten the posterior capsule, I will. I don't see enough that I would use a graft, um, which I will do on, on many of my hyperlaxity patients. And, and then I will, I will tighten the rotator interval with one or two or three sutures, including shortening the coracohumeral ligament so that I can pull the shoulder back up. And then she is unfortunately six weeks in a brace with slight external rotation, a lot of scapular exercises and core strengthening. And we'll be working on the hips during those six weeks while the shoulders are mobilized and then move into rehabilitation. Because I think, I don't know if it was, it was, it was you, Philippe, or, or Giuseppe said, you really have to work on core, hip, and posture. And that's absolutely critical with this. If we can't work from the ground up, we're not going to win the battle. Um, thank you very much, because I think that a lot of surgeons does many mistakes regarding this problem, because when you have a trauma, when you analyze with a mistake the CT scan, you can do a, a bad operation, and sometimes it's the beginning of the, of the mistake. Thank you for your expert, because I think that it's very, very important for the attendees to know that the expert doesn't go to the surgery immediately, but analyze the scapula on the, on the posterior anterior stability. Thank you very much. So this case is a little bit similar. It's a 19-year-old patient. He's right-handed, but he injured the left side. He's a student, and his goal is to become a, to work in sports. And um, he plays rugby at a competitive level and he trains six hours a week. But when you're going to see him, you will see on the videos that he doesn't look like a rugby player, but he does a lot of rugby. And uh, 10 months ago, when I saw him, uh, he had a subluxation after a rugby tackle and he felt his shoulder pop out and with spontaneous reduction. And since then, he has a very disabling posterior instability. When you examine him, uh, lying down on the bed, he has full passive range of motion. He has a, a high passive external rotation. So you can say he has hyperlaxity of the shoulder and uh, he has never had any episode of uh, voluntary instability. And so um, the problem is when you examine him for active range of motion, a little bit like Philippe's patient, as soon as he tries to elevate the arm above 30 degrees, his shoulder pops out, it's painful and he cannot uh, do anything else. His scapulothoracic exam is, is relatively normal. You're going to see it. And uh, his electromyographic studies are, are perfectly normal. And so when we look at him, I can show him. And you can see his shoulder pop out. But the scapula does not move a lot. Okay. Uh, so, so in abduction, it's okay. It's not too bad, but it's just in elevation. I would like to have a video from the back, but unfortunately I don't. And I have a last video of him. With external rotation, you can see that he has probably some hyperlaxity. And so in external rotation, elevation, uh, so external rotation and abduction is not too bad, but active elevation, he dislocates. And so if I show you again the presentation. So he has radiographs and you can see that on the radiographs, he has a uh, posterior dislocation of the, of the head. And we had comparative radiographs, so the right contralateral side and the left injured side. And you can see that it looks on the radiograph that there is severe retroversion, a little bit like a Philips patient. And again, he's 19 years old, so 
he may have uh, what the body described. And we have a CT arthrogram that I'm going to show you. And he has more, he has this sagittal views. And we have also an arthro MRI. And so the retroversion does not look too bad on that exam, which is surprising when we think of the X-ray again. And so what are your thoughts for this patient? Uh, Philippe, maybe, what, what do you think? What do you think of his clinical exam? I know it's not complete. We cannot see very well the scapulothoracic motion on his exam. But uh, I can assure you that it was quite normal. Yeah. Um, and then the, what do you think of his uh, uh, MRI, Arthur CT? Yeah. Uh, I believe that he truly had a traumatic uh, posterior shoulder yeah. subluxation. I mean, the sport would indicate so. Uh, who knows, um, rugby or American football-like sports, uh, this is severe uh, forces that are applied to the shoulder. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the structural defect visible on MRI and on CT scan, at least in my, from my point of view, is not very severe. Uh, and what can be said is that even though he plays a lot of rugby, his uh, musculature is not very well developed. So, yes, I will give him some structural defect, but for sure, this structural defect is not able to justify this location with, a, I would call it, 30 degrees of elevation. This is almost no elevation that he needs to do in order to dislocate out the back. So, I would well, I would also add some functional component to it for sure. And uh, uh, for me, it's the same course of treatment. Give him a go, three months of conservative treatment, re rehabilitation, as we just discussed. Go into a very specific rehabilitation process. If this doesn't work, then I would suggest the same course as Buddy just suggested. Tell him, okay, you did it for three months. Now the surgery is going to uh, mark the beginning of your new rehabilitation process. So you do surgery on him fix the posterior labral tear, do some placation as well, help him to stabilize the shoulder. But he needs to be aware that without improving his functional component, he won't have a stable shoulder in the end. That's my belief. This is a, this is a vote. If the attendees can take a, a few seconds to vote, what is for you the best way for this patient? Philip, but with a, a top level uh, faculty, we, uh, anterior is very clear uh, critical bone loss. But which is uh, the posterior critical bone loss? Because Philip uh, uh, spoke about, uh, for me, no uh, critical bone loss. Uh, of course, in CT and MRI, yes. But uh, in X ray, it's very, very. I, I, I is difficult to say no critical bone loss. Probably it is necessary 3D CT to quantify the critical bone loss because, uh, of course, physiotherapy. But uh, after that, if uh, the physiotherapy fail, uh, it is necessary only soft tissues. Uh, Repair or bone graft? I have, a, I have a question for the expert because do you know the paper of Dominique Meyer? Of course, yeah. because uh, he reported the correlation between the, the shape of the acromion and the, the height of the, the, when the acromion is flat and when the distance between the acromion yeah. and the center of the head is very high, you have a risk of posterior instability. In your practice, do you measure that? Uh, do you are agree with that? Because, uh, uh, buddy, do you have an answer regarding that? So, so I do not measure it. I look for it, um, but I don't do specific measurements. So it's one of those when you see it, 
and it's displaced down that that distance is high then i i think of dominic and i think of that that part of it and it may play a role i just don't know how to predict <clears throat> i don't know that it predicts treatment for me i think okay. it means that i you know if i see that on an x-ray before i walk in i'm expecting to hear that there's an inferior and a posterior inferior component to the to the shoulder problem but I don't know if that's a deltoid palsy or an instability or what else is going on until I walk, until I examine the patient. So history and exam, but I do think it's it's something that is a warning sign to us that you should think that an instability problem may coexist with whatever other pathology. The other thing to point out on this is always interesting to me that your plain X-rays, your axillary and your Bernardo view will look like a glenoid dysplasia, and then you get your CT arthrogram and your MRI, and the glenoid looks okay. <clears throat> I did think on the MR arthrogram, uh, Jean-David, that there was a, some dye leaking between the, the cartilage yeah. and the bone, and to me, that's not one I can rehab. So I think that's a functional thing where it separates because as Giuseppe brought up the point of bone loss, and essentially that's a functional bony bank art posteriorly. And so I would tend to fix those more early than I would later uh, just because of that. <clears throat> so you can see how the, uh, as it's, it's a big lesion, and then as you get there, you could see dye leaking in. And so the dye that's inside there tells me that that's more of a significant injury, right? And this lesion, see it's going in there. So I would be worried about that. But so th this patient had seen several surgeons before, before I saw him, and he already had lots of physiotherapy. I remember calling Philip about uh, Philip Moroder because everybody's called Philip here. Philip Moroder uh, before uh, when I saw this patient because I wanted to try the pacemaker on this one, and it was not available in France at that time, and so I did not know what to do, and so. So I asked several uh, other surgeons and and based on the x-ray and not on the on the on the arthro ct and the and the mri i was told and i did that to do a, a bone block an open posterior bone block and it worked very well in this patient so i'm going to show you the the result so i'm showing you again the the same thing but seven So this is the bone block, iliac crest, very classical technique, nothing fancy. Jen David. Yes. What do you think about the difference of dysplasia and hypoplasia? Because sometimes in literature, there is a lot of difference, but no a lot of confusion. I think this is a, a case wonderful. Uh, I probably, I, I, um, I did the same uh, indication in this case. Probably at seven o'clock there is a, a hypoplasia zone. What do you think about this? Not the dysplasia. I, I think it's it's a hypoplastic glenoid that uh, that uh, because of the trauma uh, became worse. I think that's what happened to this one. But uh, I I don't have any. I'm not sure of anything. But I think that's that's what happened to him. Yeah. But yeah, uh, in this case, uh, the surgical mm -hmm. technique uh, correct very well the bone, not the soft tissues. I agree, yes, and this is his result. I was looking for the result, I'm sorry. And now he plays rugby and he's happy. The question for the experts on the, in the chat, there is a question. Where, where is the place for capsuloplasty on labrum repair? On so I think, yeah, so block. I think, so I think in this case, there, there are two factors, one, <clears throat> the fact that he had such low level instability and it seemed to be that he fractured that cartilage analog, that's an indication for me for early surgery. So I would have gone in 
uh, and it's not as critical for posteriors that it's low level instability like it is anterior, but that's a big thing and it's painful and that is separating. And to me, that's a surgical, not emergency, but some urgency to it because you only have a certain amount of time to put it back have it heal and then begin the ossification process. If it doesn't do that, and if there's some time, uh, then Giuseppe, Jean David uh, are 100% correct. Now you have a dysplasia of the glenoid because you've lost that analog. So now you have to do a bone block procedure. And then part two, rugby players are collision athletes. And so I have a low tolerance. I learned this from Matt Preventure um, that if, you are, if you're a collision athlete and you have some posterior bone missing, adding bone is a nice way to do it. And I usually use a small piece of the scapular spine because I'm right there anyway. So you can make a small incision, take a piece of that and move it down because you don't need a lot of bone. But there's no problem with crest, clavicle. Uh, wherever your local uh, the, the source is to get the bone, but you need some bone block. And then I would do a capsuloplasty on top of it just to make sure that it was tight. In a traumatic, like this gentleman, I would not necessarily close the rotator interval unless there were signs of hyperlaxity. But I think what happened is he had an issue, went through several physicians, the analog just sort of left or dissolved and was no longer present. And then you had to do a bone procedure. So um, I, I would have treated him that way based on his exam and the history you provided. Felix, so if we, uh, I remember sure. your uh, uh, clinical examination in uh, Tulan University with a football player. But uh, for young surgeon, the clinical examination is completely different in uh, your uh, athletes because uh, the test is 90 degrees, Fulcum test, Kim test, but is a provocative test, not the same symptomatology. It's completely different pathology, posterior, but different aspect. What do you think about this? So I, I think you're 100% correct. It's all about etiology. We've seen two patients that would both be classified as posterior instability, yet completely different not even close to the same thing. And even though both were athletes, our first patient was had laxity, should have responded to rehabilitation, uh, you know, and mostly a laxity component with scapular dyskinesia. So that's a rehab patient all along. You know, she, she can make it dislocate a little bit, but it's not terrible. The second patient, <clears throat> low level instability. By the time we, we start treating him, he has bone loss and deficiency and dysplasia. And that becomes a surgery and he wants to play a collision sport as opposed to an overhead sport. So two patients, very similar imaging, history is not that dissimilar, yet completely different pathology and treatment, which is the, the wonder to me of posture instability. It's never one key lesion, it's all over the place. I think it's great and it really, really makes all of us better physicians and surgeons to do the exam correctly and try to sort out where the problem is. So that if we if we want to keep things really really simple maybe maybe too simple is is the the fact that there is dye between the bone and the labrum uh, the the main thing to to remember basically if you have that if you have that cartilage analog and you see dye even if it's a small amount between the analog and the bone that has to be fixed right away otherwise if you wait you're going to end up doing bone restoration because you won't have enough of a of a saucer to hold the ball in and and the surgery looked beautiful it was perfect i was very well done i was very impressed um and but you you look at the ct scan and your saucer is perfect and so this patient should do very well and be able to go back to rugby but that's not not as easy to do as as you would think um especially posteriorly because if you're too flat it kind of slides and will atrophy and if you're too up you'll lead to arthritis and it'll bump on the thing on, on the bone itself so that was that was just really it was, it was a beautiful thing to see like watching Look, Gilles do a, like watching jill do a latarge in the front yeah. so beautiful and uh, your bone blocks because i know there's a study from matt proventure do your bone blocks you do them rectangle or do you draw an angle like a like a triangle so I, 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 draw, I draw an angle. I, okay. I don't like a flat bone block. Um, and for what I'm trying to do, I think uh, I think an angle is better and try to mesh it and shape it that way. 
So, and I, Giuseppe, I think, said about getting a 3D CT scan, and that's a nice thing. And then you can draw it, and then you have a plan that you want to make your bone block. So, I, I think it makes a difference. Philippe, uh, for the attendees, would you summarize in your experience indication of capsuloplasty on labrum repair on bone block? Please, very simple for the attendees because there is many questions on. It's always difficult to choose between the both. Sorry, I didn't get the second part of your sentence. So, posterior labral and capsular shift and? Yes, and bone, and bone block. block. Uh, and bone block. So, when to choose which one? Yes. For yes. The so, attendees. to be honest, in this particular case, we heard that uh, we had physiotherapy attempted before, which failed. But in my mind, this would still have been an indication for soft tissue repair, not a bone block right away because I don't believe that a uh, critical amount of bone uh, was missing. There's one study in literature by NACA indicating that 20 degrees, 20% uh, of surface area is the critical amount of bone loss. This is based on time zero biomechanical studies. Um, as we know from anterior shoulder instability, this is where 20 years ago we also started with 20%. This, this percent narrowed down more towards 10%, so I guess this is going to be the same for posterior shoulder instability as we proceed with our biomechanical studies. Uh, if I like, if I want to do a bone block, then for me it's going to be something that reshapes the concavity. So I like to have this uh, this shape continuing uh, of the concavity of the native glenoid, and. Um, Typically, an indication would be any case of static posterior shoulder subluxation and cases where previous soft tissue repair have failed. In this particular case, I would have attempted a, a mere soft tissue repair. Okay, thank you, thank you. But Philippe, you always told me when there is a lesion, the pacemaker is, is maybe not indicated. Exactly. And so this patient had a lesion, so, but you still would try it. No, no. Uh, you said that he already had uh, several attempts of physiotherapy. So if you, uh, yes. if you suggest the patient to have another round of physiotherapy, he will tell you, uh, I, I'm going to see another surgeon. And no, he, but for example, if I, had, if, if I had had the pacemaker, oh, I yeah. could have told him I have something new for you. Would you have tried that regardless? Yeah. So uh, okay. in my mind, yes because I still believe that muscles play a big role in this patient. But I would have told him exactly the same thing as Buddy said. We attempt this for a limited amount of time. We do the surgery and then you have to continue with the physiotherapy because I would be afraid that the surgery alone would not be enough. I mean, you showed with the bone block that apparently it was enough, but uh, I, I have a little different approach and I don't go to bo post your bone blocks quite as early maybe. And, and just one more question for body. The, technically, is it just like repairing the posterior labrum or do you take more? Do you go through the, this cartilage thing or? So it's more like a bony, a bony bank cart. And so for me, I will go, I will use a double loaded anchor. I will bring one limb entirely under the entire analog and then one through and then one through and one over but under the labrum. So you pull so this thing gets pulled back like this, and then the labrum repairs on top. And it's very solid repair. And I'll usually use at least two anchors because it's bigger than you think. It's bigger even than it looks on the on the MRI scan. And, and it's cartilage, so you can actually use a retrograde retriever to pass it. It's not like a real bony bank art where you're trying to get uh, a drill bit through hard bone. It's still cartilage. Okay, I, I, I propose the last case. It's a little different. Okay, this is a patient of 51 years old, IT technician. He does a leisure sports and he falls down the stairs on the right dominant uh, shoulder. And uh, he was very limited in range of motion and very painful shoulder. So uh, we saw the patient six weeks after the trauma, uh, very painful on no external rotation, uh, forward elevation was 80 degrees, there is no neurovascular lesion, good deltoid, and no lesion for no uh, numbness. So this is the x-rays, six weeks after trauma, 51 years old, and we did a hemorrhage. 
And this is the MRI. You see that there is a chronic posterior dislocation, slock posterior dislocation. And uh, the quality of the muscle is good. And uh, this is this is this case. You are six weeks after the trauma, 51 year old, with a lock posterior dislocation. And uh, I think that uh, the attendees should vote between uh, many ways, close reduction, open, allograft, mark login, or modify near, or posterior bone block, or posterior capsuloplasty. Uh, I show you the MRI now. This is a discussion. You have the patient in, consult in clinic today, buddy. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so I am taking him to surgery uh, <clears throat> for me, and I'm going to try uh, a gentle close reduction with him asleep. Um, other, and if I can get him close reduced, I will do an arthroscopic McLaughlin and a posterior labral repair. If I can't get him, I'll open him and pretty much or do a combined procedure where I do an open reduction. The real question is six weeks is not bad for articular cartilage, but he would be consented for a possible arthroplasty or bone graft to the front of the, of the humerus. But in general, I, I usually at six weeks, you can still very carefully get them to at least get close to back in a little bit. And then, then it becomes an easier operation, but I would do a McLaughlin with this one. Okay, but you try to do biatroscopy first for the reduction. I do. I, I will. I will do a closed reduction with him asleep, very gently with the flora scan, and see if I can release it. And if I can, then it's a, entirely an arthroscopic procedure. If I can't get him reduced, I will put an anterior superior portal in, look at it, and then try to lever him with a, with a either a uh, a small elevator from the back coming over the top to push him back up and see if I can reduce him. If I still can't get him, and I won't try for a long time arthroscopically, but if I cannot get him to reduce with those two techniques within a few minutes, then I'm going to open the open the shoulder. Okay, Giuseppe, what what are you doing? I think that uh, in the, to try a reduction is uh, the best choice. But uh, first of all. Of all I want to do quantify the bone loss, so the muscle laughing. You uh, is not too big, so atroscopy and uh, probably reemplissage with uh, uh, subscapularis. Uh, if uh, I don't uh, reach. Uh, the reduction open and uh, if you do a replissage with discoveries are, are you not afraid about the limitation of uh, medial rotation no no i'm no not excel rotation uh, i i probably uh, posterior i have just a little uh, um, at the ER zero in rep research posteriorly in anterior dislocation, but just the tendon to recall just a small limitation in it is a problem because if you open, you create uh, more uh, tightness uh, than uh, replicage, I think. Okay, Philippe, what do you think about this case, if you, if you have to treat yeah. it? So I'm not sure whether I could follow Giuseppe because my, maybe his or my connection was not that great. Um, so hopefully I'm not going to repeat what he just said. Uh, in my opinion, this uh, defect is very centrally located. It goes far into the joint. And this is very typical what we observe for reverse heel sucks lesions. If you look at a heel sucks lesion, it's farther outside the joints typically than a reverse heel sucks lesion is. So what I would do in this case, if it was an acute case, you can reduce it and, and then actually do a defect disimpaction. This can be done under arthroscopic guidance. I never do this above 
10 days, then it already gets uh, very difficult because the fracture consolidates. Uh, what I like to do in these particular cases is I do an open approach. I do a, teno, a tenodesis in a young guy or tenotomy, if you wish. Um, uh, and then I use the sulcus as an entrance point for an osteotomy, which I guide right towards the posterior edge of the reverse heel sucks defect. If you do so, you actually can medialize the entire impacted surface, which usually still contains a very nice articular surface, and then you fix it. And uh, I have had some very good experiences with that. Uh, so this would be the course of action in my hands for this patient. Do you, do you graph behind it? Uh, yes, I like to put some allograph behind it. I don't know whether it's necessary or not. Uh, I, I just do it. Um, maybe it's not necessary, but I like the idea of restoring the articular surface because it goes quite centrally into the joint. And he's still rather young. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have more comments? Because Regarding the maclaughlin, for example, you have two techniques. Uh, you detach uh, the subscapularis and you fix here, or you do a osteotomy of the of the less tuberities and you put here. Yeah. What do if you I'm... think about about this technique? Because uh, it's a modified knee on Hawkins. This is a American uh, technique, huh? maclaughlin and the modified knee on Hawkins. <laughs> What do you think about that, uh, Felix? Buddy? So I, I think both are very good techniques. Um, if I do it arthroscopically, I just do a classic McLaughlin with two anchors in the base. Um, I think Philippe Moroder had a good point about the, the anterior hill sacs being further into the joint, but the, the McLaughlin procedure has worked very well for that. Um, but a key is when you transfer, you have to internally rotate it and make sure it doesn't disengage out the back. It usually does not, but you want to make sure. If I do it open, then, then I'm really assessing that area, and I will try to do an osteotomy and bring it, bring the lesser tuberosity and use it as a space-occupying lesion. Not as elegant as an osteotomy uh, to elevate the, the fragment, but I haven't had good luck doing that. Probably I do too thin of an osteotomy. And then the last option is always a partial replacement or a complete replacement if you really think your articular cartilage is damaged and your deformity is too great. So I think one of the keys to anyone listening is that you would, if you go in to do this, you wanna have all of your options on the table and be able to have everything available. You don't wanna get in there and go, oh, I should replace it and not have that, have the patient consented for it and not have that equipment available. Very important. Okay, you, you try to do a, a close reduction, but it was very, very difficult, and we decided to do a deltopector approach to reduce gentle uh, the, the posterior dislocation. And after we we use a technique of mad loading modified, uh, and uh, you didn't use a screw, but we use uh, two anchors to fix the less tuberosities a little medially uh, to. Uh, to stabilize the shoulder. After we mobilize uh, the patient in extra rotation for, for four weeks, and uh, I will show you because we did uh, two weeks ago, and she is, she is stable. But I, I, I think that uh, in my experience, if you do remplissage of reverse heel sacs, you limit the range of motion. Do you have not the same experience except hyperlaxity. But in yeah, this yeah. case, there is no hyperlaxity. This is a traumatic case. And I think that the best way is to, uh, so the, the, the treatment proposed by Philippe, maybe, or uh, in my experience, my plugin modified does a good results. What do you think about remplissage, Philippe? Uh, I have the same feeling about uh, the McLaughlin remplissage uh, for the reverse heel sucks defect, as you just mentioned. Um, my indication to treat the reverse heel sucks defect is uh, quite limited. I, I use the gamma angle to measure the critical size of the defect and I typically go for it if it's above 90 degrees, more or less. This is just a biomechanical uh, data that I don't know whether we can translate it directly into the real world. 
but this is very far into the joint. So I also worry that the subscapularis insertion into this defect uh, will actually create some problems. And there's two differences uh, as how to do this. Either you detach the subscapularis and then reinsert it completely, or you just do it the same way as you do a, a remplissage for anterior shoulder instability, where you actually uh, tie the, let's say the, the end part of the tendon without attaching it into the defect. And in these cases, I definitely uh, fear limited range of motion. So I don't do it, but I, I can't give you any results as I don't do it. So <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have more comments, uh, Buddy or no, or GD? No? no, I would say that when I do it arthroscopically, I have not had significant stiffness. And it may be, as uh, Philippe Moroder talked about, we're folding it as opposed to detaching it and putting it in. So I've not had significant stiffness with that. A little bit with the uh, osteotomy when I move it in, which is why I prefer to do it arthroscopically. Um, but I think I think we're dealing with a different entity than with anterior and a, and a regular posterior heel sac. This is a little bit different. If we can have them braced and externally rotated for about four weeks, to let it heal because the subscapular is a better tendon, heals more quickly, and I think you can rehab them, get back closer to normal. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all the experts. We lost Giuseppe, uh, but um... very great discussion. Very great discussion. And uh, thank you, buddy, and thank you, Philip. And uh, we have the next uh, shoulder board in one month. It will be very funny, and uh, this is a good idea of GD, is uh, how to manage uh, a shoulder arthritis with more than 30 degrees of benoid retroversion. And we will send the CT scan of three patients to the expert. The expert should be Gilles Valch. Thank you, Gilles. Don't uh, forget the uh, appointment in one month. Uh, Mark Frankel, uh, uh, Peter Abermeyer, and, uh, and uh, Mark Frankel, Gilles, Peter Abermeyer. Uh, I don't remember the last one. Christian Gerber. Christian Gerber. Christian Gerber. And they, they, they will work before the discussion, and they will present us how to manage this uh, very huge deformity. I think that it will be it will be very funny and very attractive because uh, they will defend uh, each position, each software, and the approach. And thank you very much for all the attendees. I hope so that this uh, shoulder board is very effective for your patient because the posterior instability is very very difficult problem. And maybe the one message is: Do you? not forget the rehabilitation, take time to, to take the good uh, decision, discuss with your colleagues and discuss uh, with your experts. You can send email and to have the, the, the good, to, co to, to know the good way for your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Ciao, buddy. Ciao. Hope we see everyone soon in person. Bye, John.